Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. What advantage, then, has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So Paul just carefully explained in Romans chapter 2 that the possession of the law or circumcision will not save a Jewish person. If this is the case, then what is the advantage of being God's chosen nation? After all, if there is no partiality with God, Romans chapter 2 verse 11, what good is it to be Jewish? Well, much in every way. Paul knows that there are many advantages God gave the Jewish people. In particular, he entrusted them with the oracles of God which speaks of God's written revelation before the time of Jesus. He gave the Jewish people his word, and that is an indescribable gift. And this was their prime privilege, that they were God's library keepers. That is a heavenly treasure that was concredited to them. Paul will later expand on the advantage of the Jewish people in Romans chapter 9, verse 4, explaining that Israel also had the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Verses 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So the fact that the Jewish people as a whole to that point had rejected the gospel did not mean that God's faithfulness to them was in vain. It did not mean that God's work was futile or without effect. So I have to say with Paul, what if some did not believe? Well, that's, not nothing, that's nothing new, for there have always been some who have rejected the revelation of God. So what then? You and I had better go on believing and testing for ourselves and proving the faithfulness of God and living, under, uh, living upon Christ our Lord. Even though we see another set of doubters and another and yet another, uh, you know, ad infinitum, the, the gospel is no failure as many of us know. And so Paul is going to remind us that God will be justified in all of his actions. In the end, it will be demonstrated that even our unrighteousness somehow proclaimed his righteousness and glory, even if only in judgment. So let God be true, but every man a liar. It's a strange and strong expression, but it's none too strong. If God says one thing and every man in the world says another, God is true and all men are false. God speaks the truth and cannot lie. God cannot change. His word, like himself, is immutable. We are to believe God's truth if nobody else believes it. The general consensus of opinion is nothing to a Christian. He believes God's word, and he thinks more of that than of the universal opinion of men. Verse 5. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. So, Paul brings the counter-argument of the opponent, right? If my unrighteousness will demonstrate God's righteousness, how can God judge me? My sin ultimately serves to bring him more glory, and that is good. Uh, Paul was familiar with the line of thinking that says, God is in control of everything. Even my evil will ultimately demonstrate his righteousness. Therefore, God is unjust if he inflicts his wrath on me because I'm just a pawn in his hand. So... In theory, the most, uh, the most dramatic example of someone who might ask this question would be Judas. And you can hear Judas uh, making his case, like, Lord, I know I betrayed you, but you used it for good. In fact, if I hadn't done what I did, Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross at all. Uh, what I did even fulfilled the scriptures, right? So how can you judge me at all? And the answer to Judas might go like this. Yes, God used your wickedness, but it was still your wickedness. There was no good or pure motive in your heart at all. And it's no credit to you that God brought good out of your evil. You stand guilty before God. So this doesn't mean, uh, when Paul says, I speak as a man, it's not going to mean that Paul is without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or the apostolic, uh, the apostolic authority. Instead, he explains that only as a man, a fallen man at that, would anyone dare to question God's justice. Verse 6 through 8. Certainly not, for then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. So Paul dismissed the question of his opponent easily. If things were such as his opponent suggested, then God could judge no one. 
And it, it is true that God will use even the unrighteousness of man to accomplish his work and bring praise to his name. Judas' betrayal of Jesus is the perfect example. Nevertheless, part of the way God glorifies himself in man's sin is by righteously judging that unrighteousness. So, <clears throat> how will God judge the world? So, for both Paul and his readers, it was a given that a judgment day was coming, when some will be acquitted and some will be condemned. He didn't need to contest this point. It was simply understood in that culture. And Paul understood that God would judge the world, both Jew and Gentile. Many of the Jews of Paul's day figured that God would condemn the Gentile for his sin, but save the Jew despite his sin. And so Paul is going to restate the objection of the imaginary questioner. You know, if God will glorify himself through my lie, how can he judge me since I seem to indirectly increase his glory? Right? Let us do evil that good may come. And this is a perversion of Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. Right? The, the easy believism. Right? It's uh, the license to sin that you hear about. And an extension of the objection of his imaginary questioner. If you take the thinking of Paul's adversary far enough, you end up saying, well, let's sin as much as we can so God can be glorified even more. This shows us that one way to examine a teaching is to extend its meaning and consequences and see where you end up. And of course, let us do evil that good may come was not Paul's teaching. He was slanderously reported to teach this. Uh, still, it's possible to see how this accusation came as Paul freely preached forgiveness and salvation by grace through faith in Jesus and not works. Most Christian preaching is so far from the true gospel of free grace that Paul preached that there is no way anyone could, it, could even slanderously report that they taught, let us do evil that good may come. If we find ourselves sometimes accused of preaching a gospel that is too open and too centered on faith and grace and God's work, then we find ourselves in good company with Paul. And so their condemnation is just. Paul will not even answer such an absurd twisting of his gospel. He simply says to those who would teach such things or accuse Paul of teaching them that their condemnation is just. God rightly condemns anyone who teaches or believes such a thing. <clears throat> and so twisting the glorious free gift of God and Jesus into a supposed license to sin is perhaps the peak of man's depravity. It takes the most beautiful gift of God and perverts it and mocks it. This twisting is so sinful that Paul saves it for last because it's beyond the depravity of the pagan in Romans chapter 1 verse 24 through 32, beyond the hypocrisy of the moralist in Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 5, and beyond the false confidence of the Jew from Romans chapter 2 verse 17 through 29. Verse 9, what then are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. So since Paul was Jewish by birth and heritage from Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 and 6, uh, when, we, when he says we, he means we Jews. So the point is that by nature, the Jewish person is no more right with God than the pagan or the moralist. Paul demonstrates that the pagan, the moralist, and the Jew are all under sin and under condemnation. So, under sin, this is a powerful phrase, and it speaks of our slavery to sin, literally meaning sold under sin. By nature, every person knows what it's like to be a slave to sin, both Jews and Greeks. Verse 10 through 18, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So these quotations from the Psalms, and this is Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, Psalm 5, verse 9, Psalm 140, verse 3, Psalm 10, verse 7, and Psalm 36, verse 1, and from Isaiah 59, verses 7 and 8, are all going to support this opening statement. And so <clears throat> Paul looks at the human condition here from top to bottom. He begins with the head and moves down to the feet. Right? It's an x-ray study of the lost sinner from head to foot. And this look at the human conditioning is um, depressing. Right, So what's the point? The Apostle Paul wants us to understand that our complete inability to save ourselves. The fall touches every part of man's being. 
and the inventory of body parts corrupted by the fall will demonstrate this. So when God finds none righteous, it is because there are none. It isn't as if there were some and God couldn't see them. Uh, there has never been a truly righteous man apart from Jesus Christ. Even Adam was not righteous. He was innocent, not knowing good and evil. And so we deceive ourselves into thinking that man on his own really does seek after God. But doesn't you know all the religion and rituals and practices from the beginning of time demonstrate that man seeks after God? Not at all. If man initiates the search, then he doesn't seek the true God, the God of the Bible. Instead, he seeks an idol that he makes himself. All right. So pay, pay attention here. <clears throat> the word unprofitable has the idea of rotten fruit. It speaks of something that was permanently bad and therefore useless. And with these references from the Psalms, Paul calls virtually every part of man's body into guilt. The throat, tongue, lips, mouth, feet, eyes are filled with sin and rebellion against God. Their feet are swift to shed blood, right? For example, the LA Times reported in 92, uh, the murders reached a record level of 800 in LA County. Uh, and this is going to, there's no fear of God before their eyes, is going to summarize the entire thought. Every sin and rebellion against God happens because we do not have a proper respect for him. Wherever there is sin, there is no fear of God. Verse 19 and 20. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, Paul is going to point out that this horrific description of man's utter sinfulness comes to us in the law, and it's intended for those under the law, to silence every critic and to demonstrate the universal guilt of mankind, that all the world may become guilty before God. And if God speaks this way to those who had the law and attempted to do the law, then it's evident that by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Remember that many Jewish people of Paul's day took every passage of the Old Testament describing evil and applied it only to the Gentiles, not to themselves. Paul makes it clear that God speaks to those who are under the law. And the law cannot save us. The law cannot justify anyone. It's useful in giving us the knowledge of sin, but it cannot save us. It doesn't have the power to save us. And since the time of Adam and Eve, people have tried to justify themselves by the deeds of the law. In the Garden of Eden, Adam tried to make himself presentable to God by making coverings out of fig leaves, and he failed. In Job, the oldest book of the Bible, the problem is presented clearly. How can a man be righteous before God in Job chapter 9, verse 2? God makes part of the answer clear here through Paul. The answer is not in the performance of good works. It's in the, you know, in the deeds of the law. How we need to deeply understand this by you know, the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. This means that the law, having been broken, can, uh, now can only condemn us. It can't save us. This means that even if we could now begin to perfectly keep the law of God, it could not make up for past disobedience or even remove our present guilt. And this means that keeping the law is not God's way of salvation or of blessing under the new covenant. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So these words provide the most glorious transition from the judgment of verse 20 to the justification of verse 21. But now is going to speak of the newness of God's work in Jesus Christ. It really is a new covenant being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's going to remind us that there is still continuity with God's former uh, with work with God's work in former times. And so the law cannot save us, but God reveals a righteousness that will save us apart from the law. This is the essence of God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. It is a salvation that is offered apart from the law, apart from our own earning and deserving, apart from our own merits. This righteousness is not a novelty. Paul didn't invent it. It was predicted long ago, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament said this righteousness was coming. Right? Even Job said, I know that I have a Redeemer coming, an intercessor. And so it isn't that the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the Old Testament, but that it is revealed apart from the principle of law. It is apart from a legal relationship to God based on the idea of earning and deserving merit before him. And so the Greek puts the very front of this great phrase, apart from the law, chorus nomo, 
Uh, and this sets forth most strongly the Greek separateness of this divine righteousness from any law performance, any works of man whatsoever. God's righteousness is not offered to us as something to take up the slack between our ability to keep the law and God's perfect standard. It is not given to supplement our own righteousness. It's given completely apart from our own attempted righteousness. Verse 22, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So in verse 21, Paul told us how this righteousness does not come. It does not come through the deeds of the law. It's apart from the law. Now Paul tells us how this saving righteousness does come through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. So the righteousness of God is not ours by faith. It is ours through faith. We do not earn righteousness by our faith. We receive righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Through faith points to the fact that faith is not a merit to earning salvation. It is no more the, than the means through which the gift is given. But faith is not trusting or expecting God to do something, but relying on his testimony concerning the person of Christ as his son and the work of Christ for us on the cross. After saving faith, the life of trust begins. Trust is always looking forward to what God will do. But faith sees that what God says has been done and believes God's word, having the conviction that it is true and true for ourselves. And there is no other way to obtain this righteousness. This righteousness is not earned through the obedience of the law. It is a received righteousness gained through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So being justified. Paul develops his teaching about salvation about around three themes here. Justification is an image from the court of law. Redemption is an image from the slave market. And propitiation is an image from the world of religion appeasing God through sacrifice. Justification solves the problem of man's guilt before a righteous judge. Redemption solves the problem of man's slavery to sin, the world, and to the devil. Propitiation solves the problem of offending our Creator. So this universal statement, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, is answered by a universal offer to be justified freely by His grace. It is open to everyone who will believe. And it's impossible to describe every way that we fall short, but there are four important ways that man will fall short of the glory of God. We fail to give God the glory due him in our words, thoughts, and actions. We fail to qualify for and thereby reject the glory and reward that God gives faithful servants. We fail to properly reflect God's glory by refusing to be conformed to his image. And we fail to obtain the final glory God will bestow on his people at the end of all history. So being in such a sinful state, the only way we can be justified is to be justified freely. We can't purchase it with our good works at all. If it isn't made free to us, we can't have it all. So we are justified freely by his grace, his unmerited favor given to us without regard to what we deserve. It is a giving, uh, a giving that is motivated purely by the giver and motivated by nothing in the one who receives. So freely is the ancient Greek word durean. Uh, the way this word is used in other New Testament passages helps us to understand the word. Matthew chapter 10 verse 8, freely you have received, freely give. And Revelation 22 verse 17, and whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Show that the word truly means free, not just cheap or discounted. Perhaps the most striking use of the ancient Greek word duran is in John 15 verse 25, where it says, they hated me without a cause, duran. Uh, even as there was nothing in Jesus deserving a man's hatred, so there is nothing in us deserving of justification. All the reasons are in God. So again, Paul's gospel centers squarely in Christ Jesus. Salvation is possible because of the redemption found in him. God cannot give us his righteousness apart from Jesus Christ. And redemption has the idea of buying back something. It involves a cost. 
However, God pays the cost, and so we're justified freely. The word translated redemption had its origin describing the release of prisoners of war on payment of a price and was known as the ransom. As time went on, it was extended to include the freeing of slaves, again, by the payment of a price. The idea of redemption means that Jesus bought us, therefore we belong to him. Paul expressed this thought in another letter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Verse 25 and 26. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over his sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, Jesus, by his death, by his blood, was a propitiation, right? A substitute sacrifice for us. As he was judged in our place, the Father could demonstrate his righteousness and judgment against sin while sparing those who deserve the judgment. And so the ancient Greek word for propitiation, hilasterion, uh, is also used in the Septuagint for the mercy seat, the lid that was covering the Ark of the Covenant, upon which sacrificial blood was sprinkled as an atonement for sin. And again, that was looking forward to Jesus Christ. And while it might be said that this passage means that Jesus is our mercy seat, it probably has more of the straightforward idea of propitiation, a substitute sacrifice. And so at the same time, the mercy seat idea should not be neglected as an illustration of propitiation. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the evidence of man's great sin. You had the tablets of law, the manna received ungratefully, the budded rod of Aaron showing man's rejection of God's leadership, uh, up over the Ark of the Covenant were the symbols of the holy presence of the enthroned God in the beautiful gold cherubim. Uh, and in between the two stood the mercy seat. And as sacrificial blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16, God's wrath was averted because a substitute had been slain on behalf of sinners coming by faith. So we can really say that Jesus is our mercy seat standing between guilty sinners and the holiness of God. And so, whom God set forth as a propitiation is going to show that Jesus did not somehow appease a reluctant and unwilling father to hold back his wrath. Instead, it was the God the Father who initiated the propitiation, whom God set forth. So God, in his forbearance, had passed over the sins of those Old Testament saints who trusted in the coming Messiah. At the cross, those sins were no longer passed over, they were paid for. So the idea is that through the animal sacrifice of the Old Testament, those who looked in faith to the coming Messiah had their sins covered by sort of an IOU or a promissory, uh, like a note, that temporary covering was redeemed for full payment at the cross. The work of Jesus on the cross freed God from the charge that he lightly passed over sin committed before the cross. Those sins were passed over for a time, but they were finally paid for. So at the cross, God demonstrated his righteousness by offering man justification, which is a legal verdict of not guilty, uh, while remaining completely just because the righteous penalty of sin had been paid at the cross. So it's easy to see how someone could be only just, simply send every guilty sinner to hell, as a just judge would do. It's easy to see how someone could only be the justifier, simply tell every guilty sinner, I declare a pardon, you're all declared not guilty. But only God could find a way to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so here we learn that God designed to give the most evident displays of both his justice and mercy, of his justice in requiring a sacrifice and absolutely refusing to give salvation to the lost world in any other way, and of his mercy in providing the sacrifice which his justice required. Verse 27, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So, where is boasting then? And it shouldn't be anywhere because we're justified freely by his grace. There is no room for self-congratulation or credit. Boasting and pride are not excluded because there is some specific passage in the law against them. Instead, pride is excluded because it is completely incompatible with the salvation that is freely ours through faith. Boasting is excluded by the law of faith. And so there's no room for boasting. And this is why the natural man hates being justified freely by his grace. 
Grace absolutely refuses to recognize his imagined merits and gives no place to his pride whatsoever. Verse 28 through 30. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So it isn't that we're all uh, justified by faith plus whatever deeds of the law we can do. We are justified by faith alone, apart from the deeds of the law. And so, since all works of law are barred out, faith alone is left. And so, doesn't James contradict this passage in uh, passages like James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26? And this comes up. In James chapter 2, verses 14, uh, we'll say, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works, and show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Okay? And so, how, what do we do with that? Faith without works is dead. And so, how can we say that it's faith alone that saves apart from the deeds of the law? So, this is a trouble passage for a lot of people. And let's go through this. So, it is true that faith alone saves, but true faith, saving faith, a repentant faith, has a distinct character. All right? Both passages are true. It is not just agreeing with certain facts. It's not an intellectual head knowledge. It is the directing the mind and will in agreement with God. The whole purpose of the book of James is to describe the character of this saving faith. And so what James says that man is not justified by faith alone, but also by works, does not at all uh, militate against the preceding view of justification by faith alone. The reconciling of the two views depends chiefly on the drift of the argument pursued by James. For the question with him is not how men attain righteousness before God, but how do they prove it to others that are not justified. For his object was to confute hypocrites who vainly boasted that they had faith. James meant no more than that man is not made or proved to be just by a feigned or a dead faith, and that he must prove his righteousness by his works. And so this righteousness is offered to both the Jew and the Gentile. The universal character of the offer is demonstrated by a simple fact. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Well, of course he is. If there is only one God, then God is the God of the Gentiles as much as he is the God of the Jews. It's just up to the Gentiles to recognize him as God. And so not only is this righteousness available to both the Jew and the Gentile, it's also received the same way by both the Jew and the Gentile. Since one God justifies both the Jew and Gentile, he justifies them in the same way by faith and through faith. Verse 31, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So we can see how someone might ask, if the law doesn't make us righteous, then what good is it? Uh, Paul, you just made the law void. You're going against the law of God. Well, certainly not. Of course, Paul does not make void the law. As the apostle will demonstrate in the following chapter, the law anticipated the coming gospel of justification by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Therefore, the gospel establishes the law, fulfilling its own predictions.